Hi folks, thanks for joining us for the latest of the ASQ LED webinars. This one is called Process Design Under Duress. Today is August 12, 2020, and our presenter is Bill Hathaway, the CEO and founder of More Steam. Um, your organizers today are going to be Ellen Ermer and Manny Veloso. Just to let you know, our next webinar is going to be Wednesday, September 9th. Our topic is Green Six Sigma with Ron Kelly. For those of you who are new to this and, and aren't sure how to get your RUs, um, you should be getting them within about 24 hours or so of the completion of the webinar. Your certificate should look like this. And then, of course, um, it's not too difficult to upload that into my ASQ so that you can then get your RUs properly uh, noted. If you do want to ask a question, Here's how you would do that. You would double click on the, the questions tab in the meeting controls, and then you can see the instructions, select the question dialog box, type the question, and then hit send. You can send privately, you can send to all, you can send to just the organizers too if you want. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker. It's going to be Bill Hathaway, the founder and CEO of Morsteam. Um, as you can see from his bio, prior to founding Morsteam in 2000, Bill spent 13 years in manufacturing quality and operations management. After 10 years at Ford Motor Company, Hathaway then held executive level operations positions with Raytheon at Amana Home Appliances and with Mansfield Plumbing Products. Bill earned an undergraduate finance degree from the University of Notre Dame and a graduate degree in business finance and operations from Northwestern's Kellogg Graduate School of Management. And now I'd like to turn it over to Bill Hathaway. Hello, this is Bill Hathaway. I'm the CEO of More Steam, and I want to say thanks to for uh, thanks to all of you for joining me today. This is the first in a series of four sessions that we're going to be presenting uh, over the next several weeks on process modeling and uh, process design using virtual process prototyping. I'd like to start off with uh, setting this to sort of set the stage of what we're facing, uh, the, the current state of affairs and how it relates to, to uh, our process design challenges. Uh, even before the current coronavirus crisis, we're, you probably would uh, agree that we're all being faced with shortened product life cycles and certainly rising quality expectations. You know, no, nobody, uh, provides much of a grace period to, to fix new, new processes. There, the general expectation that, that things work the way they're intended the first time. Um, increasingly, we're seeing that design is viewed as a competitive advantage and a very important competitive advantage. And then, of course, there's the, the exigent circumstances of the pandemic that's forcing a lot of uh, process design on the fly. And you've all seen images like this. You've seen in your daily lives the experience of people under duress trying to come up with a process design that will solve a very immediate need. In this case, uh, screening for, uh, for COVID-19 or uh, in this case, uh, a queue line of cars lining up for food bank or food distribution. So there's a lot of very important process design work that's happening right now, you know, as we speak, that uh, that we can learn from and that also uh, presents um, in, in small and large ways a lot of opportunities to experiment with new methods. So I want to take a step back and ask historically those of us that have been involved in process improvement for a long time, how do you how do you measure how do you measure progress? And if you're like most organizations, you keep track of the projects that you're engaged in and you um, keep track of how many projects you've done and what you've saved and, and uh, you know, that's necessary and it's important to, 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 to track the savings. But if you think about it, really these kinds of measures are a measure of rework. And pro 
to make projects or other process improvement projects are largely fixing something, finding problems and fixing them in, in the existing process. And what's perhaps more important is what's unmeasured. And what's not measured is all the problems that you might have avoided if you did good design work in the first place. So the, what's, what's, the, uh, you know, what's the benefit of good process design where you don't have to run a domain project to fix something, you know, right, right, right now, while we're sitting here, there's somebody in your organization that's probably designing your next, your next opportunities for process improvement, you know, with good intentions, um, and, uh, but maybe not the best methods. And if we don't get ahead of that, um, really, um, we're faced with always cleaning up the mess. This is the, the uh, a pretty good pictorial representation of how many of you may feel sometimes when uh, you know, the ratio of process problem creators is greater than the, the process problem fixers. And you know, talk about low hanging fruit. I mean, this is fruit that's on the ground. This is, um, it's, it's kind of endless. So the real key to getting ahead of that is to move upstream and to do better process design work. The traditional view in process improvement would be that we want to get better at solving problems. Uh, maybe the new challenge would be avoid problems through design, uh, which makes sense. But ultimately, that's really um, a defensive kind of position, isn't it? And what the newer new challenge would be is how do we create opportunities through design? How can we be more proactive and assertive uh, through design to, cr to create our future? You know, all too often that design work has been done in sessions like this where there's some brainstorming around what, what's, the, what's our idea? What could we do? How are we gonna, how are we gonna get this job done? And usually there's a phrase uttered that's something like, we could just do this. And there's some kind of linear thought about a very simple process where everything, everything's gonna walk through nicely, step to step in a very planned, organized fashion. And then that process meets the real world. And we end up with something like this, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles in many, not, not all states, but many states. Nobody intended this but it's a natural outcome of the, of the process design that, uh, that was implemented. Here's a, a specific example of the importance of process design. CSX, a few years ago, went on an efficient, efficiency initiative and, and uh, closed some reconfiguration yards in the Midwest. And uh, again, uh, probably uh, well-intentioned in some, some, at least in some respects, and, and perhaps necessary. But as a result, the rail traffic in the entire Midwest was completely tangled up. And the time, transit time from Chicago to outside of Nashville, Tennessee, you can see on this chart, went from 72 hours to 446 hours. So as a result of not having a good process design, not anticipating what was likely to happen, the process was, I mean, the results are catastrophic. There were people throughout the Midwest who were trying to ship uh, via truck on an emergency basis because rail traffic was so, was so snarled. So it's a real thing. It's, um, it's um, the impact of bad process design uh, touches us in a, lot, in a lot of adverse ways. You know, I, I'm a fan of Chopped. I like to watch this cooking show, if you've ever seen it where the cooks get a challenge and a time constraint and they have to use some kind of strange ingredients. And it's, it's kind of funny when, uh, and they're, they've got, they're always in a rush, right? They've only got so much time. And so sometimes the judges will ask the chef, well, did you taste this? What, what, what is this you've given me? It doesn't, it needs, it needs seasoning or it has too much seasoning. And, Sometimes the chefs will say, well, no, I was in too big of a hurry. I didn't taste test it. And that's really a good metaphor for what situations we find ourselves in or organizations find themselves in. They're in such a hurry that 
they either don't taste test or don't have a good way to do it. Probably this, the latter is more accurate as they just don't have a really good way to taste test a new process design before it's launched. There have been traditionally some pretty good methods or somewhat useful methods for, for process design, but they have uh, a lot of, they have some constraints, some flaws, some, some drawbacks um, design for, for Six Sigma or design for Lean Six Sigma, if you're familiar with it, uh, offers a lot, but for process design, it's never really worked very well. It's never really taken hold. It's not really been embraced. And one of the reasons is it's too complicated. It's just too much. It's overdone and it's too many, it's too many tools and it's not the right tools. And there's this presumption that it's all, that following this checklist of tools is somehow magically gonna yield a, uh, a result. So I would argue that we need something new. We need better methods. We need to take from the good, the useful from, from things we've done in the past, but look to, to new methods that we can combine and um, perhaps mash up like this animal, um, this chicken rhino, take the best of uh, multiple practice areas and, and see if we could craft something that's more usable, more practical. I'm going to call that agile process design. And um, in our way of thinking, that's a combination of methods from several areas. It's pulling the best from design for Six Sigma, which um, perhaps would be the robust voice of the customer kind of um, approach and some tools like FMEA that are really useful, failure mode and effects analysis. And then from agile software development, there's really some interesting practices we can pull from, from there for, for project management, for breaking things down into manageable pieces, um, for uh, fast uh, releases, for uh, test-driven development. So involving customers, co-development, and, and really an emphasis on speed, getting things done quickly. From lean startup, there's the notion of a minimum viable product and again, a, an, a, 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 an attitude of experimentation. So uh, test-driven development, testing with customers, reacting quickly, making modifications, and, um, and learning. And then from design thinking, the, the uh, kind of takes the voice of the customer approach of design for Six Sigma up a notch, adding that level of empathy that might you know, might not have been present, um, really walking in the customer's shoes. And again, uh, a, a spirit of experimentation. And I think really importantly, the, the idea of uh, building to think, that building uh, anything, a prototype, an early product, allows you to learn and adjust and think about what you're doing. And, and, and it's really part of the creative process. Just to summarize, it's really um, three key elements. It's, it's, this, it's attitudes, having the right attitudes about design, which is an appreciation for the customer, for the voice of the customer, and, and a, a, an acceptance, an expectation of experimentation. You know, it's fine to say that uh, you, you support experimentation. You have to be willing to accept that not all experiments are going to be successful. Uh, it's having a roadmap of uh, questions. Uh, in our view, it's critical questions that guide the design process. It's not a checklist of tools. It's never a checklist of tools. It's always questions that inform what tool to use. And then at the heart of this is virtual process prototyping and iterative learning. So some way of building a virtual prototype so that you can experiment and learn. So just uh, to emphasize, emphasize that point, virtual process pro prototyping, it's really fundamentally a different way of thinking about process design um, because it's uh, using prototyping to explore a wider design space. So back to the roadmap for just a second. Um, this is a roadmap we like to use for, for uh, des design for Six Sigma or for um, agile process design both uh, define concept, design, optimize, verify. It could be in a different, it could be, you probably have heard of other roadmaps, the MADV or 
I dove or C dove or, or whatever. I don't think it really matters too much. It, what matters is having uh, organized critical questions that you make sure you answer. In the absence of that, in the absence of having a roadmap, then people t people do crazy. You know, unbounded creativity can be a dangerous thing. It can yield, it, it can produce some interesting results, both good and bad. So the roadmap is important. Um, but I think the, the difference in, in, in our thinking now about process design is that traditionally we viewed uh, design projects as uh, w w where the ideal state was a very linear, a very straight, un, kind of un, uh, 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 uninterrupted path from start to finish that uh, doesn't involve any, any rework. Because of course, engineering time is precious and we don't want to sink a lot of engineering time into something only to then rip it up and, and start over or have to make late, late revisions and all of which can be really wasteful. And that is certainly true. Um, however, uh, you know, rework is also oftentimes uh, another word for experiment. And experiments are how we learn. So I think it's uh, unfortunate to think of necessarily all rework is bad because if, if it's not expensive and it's not time consuming, it's not actually rework, it's just learning. Um, reinforcing the idea of uh, building to think, I have an example from Akron Children's Hospital a few years back where they were working on the design of a uh, new pharmacy. And so they mocked it up in cardboard. And by doing so, the people who were going to be working in the pharmacy were able to participate and they were able to, to try it out early before any uh, thing expen before any actual construction um, and before any major money was spent. So they were able to evaluate lines of sight and ergonomics and pinch points and uh, the flow through the pharmacy and so forth uh, in a way that they couldn't have done if it were uh, just on paper, if it was just a drawing on the screen. So by doing so, had, we're able to launch a much more successful uh, pharmacy. And this practice, this type of design practice has been employed in um, uh, many different settings. In fact, Apple, before they built their first Apple uh, retail store, I think built a full scale mock-up inside a warehouse so that they could uh, play around with it. So the building of any prototype, physical or virtual, helps you think about things you wouldn't have thought about otherwise. So doing it early in the concept phase helps you consider possibilities that wouldn't have otherwise been considered. And possibilities are the key to quality. I mean, if you wanna have a high quality picture, Right. Take the secret is to take lots of pictures and sort out the ones that don't work, the ones that aren't so great, and then and and find the the few. Sometimes they're happy accidents that uh, produce uh, great great um, actual great works of art. So so quantity uh, is important, and if uh, we can improve, if we can increase this the the speed and lower the cost of of uh, producing that quantity. I mean, you have a digital camera now, you can, in the old days, you'd have to take, right? You spend a lot of money on film and developing in order to take lots of pictures. Now, you can take lots of digital photos and then just erase them. So, same, so how do we apply that same kind of thinking to process design? You know, because if you can travel really fast, you can cover a lot more ground and you can then um, consider alternatives that might otherwise not have been given much uh, serious consideration. Um, I think it's important to point out that uh, embracing iteration means also understanding that this, this design roadmap is not such a linear path from start to finish, that it's a lot more iterative, that going through concept design and optimize in the middle is really circular. Right, and it's not just uh, closing off one phase with a toll gate, and moving on to the other. It's actually some trips. Um, it's a little messier than that. There's some trips back and forth. Uh, I suspect 
um, that all of you, most of you being lean practitioners are familiar with value stream maps and you've probably all been in a situation where you've worked on a process redesign, you've participated in a Kaizen event, you've come up with a ideal future state and you've drawn a map on the wall. And if you, we were all here together, if we were all in a classroom or if we were all in the same room, we could have a nice discussion about that. And you'd probably all be, you know, I'd ask you to raise your hands and you'd probably all have been, yeah, you've probably all experienced that. Um, and, and simple maps may do the trick and they be, they're, they're useful, they're, they're quick, they're participatory, and they may be sufficient. But the one thing that's missing from this kind of mapping is the central, if you think about it, what's the central problem for most process processes and their performance is variation someplace, right? So, you know, this map assumes that everything kind of happens on average. And really, when does that ever happen? You know, it's, uh, it's the variation in the world that leads to um, performance, uh, predict predictability uh, problems. So how do we contemplate in our process designs, the variation is gonna be inherent uh, uh, to the process so that we can really understand how a process is gonna perform under duress. And so I'd like to ask you um, one more poll question here. Man, if you can put up that poll, let's um, just, like to understand, I'd like to hear what your experiences have been with um, with with uh, with process design and uh, variation. Sure. So um, I just wanted to demonstrate that hey, I do know how to to uh, show poll results. So I know that's the previous one. Um, what I'm trying to do now is <laughs> get to the next one, which. Bear with me. Uh, okay. So this is going to be the last question about unplanned variation and a derailing one of your new process designs. So the idea is yes, somewhat, or no. So no means you're really good at what you do. So this is just a check on my hypothesis. Right. And then what I have to do, uh, I mean, I'll give it a few, we're not even at 50% yet. So um, I'll give it a little bit more time and then I'm going to close it and then I will show the results. So, so I'm learning about all this stuff as we go. <clears throat> okay, so we're about two thirds of the people right now. Um, and I'm not certain that you're going to be surprised by the result. So just about two thirds of people said that changes had to be made once implemented. Um, almost a, a third of the people basically said, yeah, unplanned variations completely disrupt the design. And the good news is 3% um, of people say they're really good at what they do. So who are, who are those 3%? <laughs> <laughs> good we question. Need to, we need to know what their secret sauce is. That's right. I am gonna shut off this poll now and let you continue. All right. So I think the takeaway from that is clearly that there's a lot that all of us can learn about. You know, there are a lot of things that we might do better in order to um, better design for variation. So robust design for uh, applies to processes, not just uh, products. So now we'll, I want to transition a little bit and talk about how, how might that be accomplished? How can we animate the process map? How can we take the process map we're all familiar with that's so useful and, um, and, and incorporate uh, variation? So there's something that's been around for a long time called discrete event simulation. And, and some of you doubtless have been uh, exposed to it. Uh, if any of you are industrial engineers, you probably, uh, probably got exposed to discrete event simulation in, in your uh, undergraduate curriculum, maybe on the job. Um, some of you may be familiar with some of the software applications that are out there. Um, the, the adoption has been uh, pretty narrow because uh, it's been pretty hard to do. It's pretty, pretty expensive, pretty time consuming. 
the power of but we'll but we'll you know we'll talk about where that where all that's going the um you know the power of discrete event simulation is to build a model a pro turning a process basically turning a process map into a model by adding parameters so uh, incorporating uh, step by step statistical distributions uh, expressions of variation to all of the things that happen in the process um, such that you can essentially um, well the way discrete event simulation would work is to put items through the model so you build a model and then you put uh, simulated volume through it so a thousand customers or a thousand hours or a hundred thousand hours or some period of time and just run volume through it and see what happens and by doing so you can play all kinds of what-if scenarios you know you can do that stress testing what happens if i drive a lot faster than i should what happens if bill doesn't show up for work tomorrow what happens if we have twice as much volume as we expected what happens if we our setup time um, could be re reduced what would happen if we moved uh, if we put a whip cap in place or if we moved a queue from here to there or all those kinds of questions that are really hard to answer without a model uh, to tell you how the process is going to react to the changes that you might want to consider so the first thing we want to um, the first benefit thing that the, the the reason for using uh, process modeling would be to explore so exploring a much wider landscape than what you um, might have been able to explore otherwise so uh, going back to what i said before if the if the if the if you can travel really quickly then you can cover a lot more ground and that's what uh, process modeling virtual process process prototyping is all about is being able to really very inexpensively i mean imagine if you could travel uh, if, if you could travel to any place in the world um, instantaneously and at no cost imagine what you'd go and see that you don't otherwise because it's expensive and time consuming to travel and then next is testing so non-destructive testing to see how is our process going to perform when certain things happen what's how what kind of performance can we really predict under the range of likely um, uh, scenarios uh, third is really related to the second is what, what are the levers then where how do we control this process what parameters really matter what's critical what's going to what's going to turn it upside down and how robust is it going to be for the kinds of likely variation that we're that we're going to see and then and what are the what are the controls that we need to put in place to make sure that the the, the performance uh, matches our expectations and uh, similarly uh, risk uh, risk profiling so getting a feel for where where are our risks where where are things likely to really go off the rails what's the likelihood of that and then how can we design put make modifications to our design to really evaluate our potential risk so this is really putting putting some math putting some do, really doing some some modeling homework to support uh, an, FM, an FMEA. And then lastly, and this is really important, is making your case. So if you, uh, it's all well and good to come up with, a, with, a, with an ideal future state design, um, but oftentimes you've got to get somebody to support that design change. So either emotionally or financially, organizationally, so if you if you spend the time to build a model of what you intend the new design to be and you have been able to model risk and uh, identify what the the operating and control parameters are and you've been able to test uh, performance then you have a much better case to make to the finance the people that hold the money right so um you know, ultimately, you've got to get somebody to pay for the things that you want to do. And if you build a model, you have a you have a much more demo, you you can demonstrate that you've done your homework. Uh, we have uh, some clients that are using um, 
process modeling now as part of their Kaizen events in order to make their case to the their stakeholders that because in a transactional world, you know, it's not like going out in a plant and moving equipment around. Oftentimes, there are uh, changes that are, there are some time, there's some time lags and there's maybe IT work and programming that needs to be done in order to really implement a change. And that means um, uh, priorities for IT, setting, getting it, getting a, you know, getting a reasonable spot in the queue and getting uh, resources committed. So making your case is really important. Now you might say, well, that's, this is well and good. I'd like to go to this world that you've imagined, Bill. And it's like going to this castle. It looks like it would be a nice place. You know, it's a nice place to hang out. And um, so we could all go there. Uh, it, you know, unfortunately it's not, traditionally it's not been quite that easy. There've been a few, there's been a few barriers, right? Um, the first is just like this fancy castle, it's been, Pretty expensive to do process modeling. Uh, it's involved. It's involved a lot of cost for software and a lot of cost for training. And uh, there's some some barriers and complexity. And and so it's like this moat full of alligators. Where now I've got to go build a boat for two weeks to get across the moat. And that's kind of the way it's been with discrete event simulation and and process modeling. Is it's just been daunting to go out and uh, actually do it and then you end up with so what happens is you end up with a few experts or one expert or one person that can build models and then they're a bottleneck and no one actually does it so for that reason um, and I don't want this to sound like too much of a, a commercial but the one of the reasons I'm speaking today is I've been heavily involved in this kind of work over the last year and a half in developing um, something called process playground uh, which competes with, so if you're familiar with Arena or ProModel or ExtendSim or Simulate, there's a lot of ways to do, um, to build process models and to do discrete event simulation. We've been really focused on trying to be the Southwest Airlines of process modeling, you know, make it inexpensive enough and easy enough that um, someone will fly who wouldn't, wouldn't have otherwise considered flying. They would have taken the bus uh, or walked. <laughs> Or, or whatever. So we're trying to make it a little bit more accessible. Now, to, just to show you what discrete event simulation is all about, they all, whatever uh, software you might use is gonna have you build, a, basically build a map of your process, lay it out and have certain um, process blocks and logic steps. And, and so you can see, uh, in this case, this is an emergency room very simplified front end of a, of a, a uh, emergency department process where patients come in and they register and then they wait to see a nurse, they get triaged and then they might get sent for some diagnostics, x-rays and whatnot, and then based on, the, or they might get sent home. Um, and then based on the diagnostic work, um, so maybe I go in and I have a, well, my ankles sore, I think I broke it, um, I, I go get an x-ray, no, I didn't break it, um, you know, I, and I get some, maybe some treatment and I'm, I'm sent home, or maybe I'm, maybe I did break it, maybe I'm admitted and I have to have surgery on my ankle. So, so this is a way of laying out the, pro, the various process steps and then the way discrete event simulation works is that you would, for each of the process steps, you would specify uh, something about the very expected variation of that step how many, and, and also kind of what resources are at play. So um, if I'm gonna see the doctor for treatment, then there might be a question of, well, how many doctors are there? And then what's the likely time that it's gonna to take to see the doctor? And that might be, there might be a whole lot of variation, of course, in uh, something like that. In so doing, then we can run uh, a lot of patients through the model, and then we could see, well, it, where is their bottleneck? Where do, the, where do the patients stack up? And in this model that I created just for demonstration purposes, you can see they're stacking up behind uh, the doctor um, for treatment. So if we were doing process design, then we might ask, well, what would happen if um, we had one more doctor? Or what would happen if we did something that made uh, it easier for the doctors to, to do their work? 
okay? So maybe they're messing around. Maybe they have electronic medical records that are uh, really cumbersome and hard for them to use that take up a lot of time, which is almost kind of like a setup cost because it happens on every, it's almost a fixed time for every patient. So maybe we could do something to reduce that and then we could see how, how does the process perform. Some examples from the real world. So this is actually being done. It's being used, this, these, these, this, uh, this approach to process modeling, um, uh, COVID-19 screening. So I know we've worked with some hospitals uh, who were um, forced to come up with process, new, new processes very quickly, such as uh, one hospital was, uh, had a problem with employees coming to work and going through screening um, that was taking a long time. Uh, you can imagine they had to be, they were being tested, having their temperature taken, uh, so on and so forth. And they had lines and then, the, and also uh, maintaining certain distance between people and they were, had lines out into the parking lot. So the question was, how do we speed that up? How many people do we need to be doing this? We were able to build a model. Hospital was able to go to a senior leadership and had a lot of facts in the present around what, what exactly how many, resources need to be committed to straighten this out. Um, discrete event simulation is commonly used for call centers. I don't know if any of you have worked with call centers, uh, process design, but it's a great way of modeling the mix and complexity of different calls that are coming in and how they're routed. Um, we've worked with uh, airlines on ba baggage drop. So uh, imagine uh, the baggage drop process and there's a queue and Maybe there's a thought that we, we could add, we don't like the length of the queue, we could add some people to speed it up, but we model it and then find that, well, maybe adding people isn't actually gonna solve the problem. Um, another, I mean, imagine all the problems that are going on in transportation, in modeling, uh, how do we turn aircraft around uh, when uh, we, we're, we're gonna be boarding in smaller groups and we're trying to keep people spaced out and what's that going to do to the time it takes to load and unload aircraft, which affects the whole schedule? Um, you know, really important kinds of questions that you can't easily answer with a static uh, future state map. And then uh, some really, I've seen some really interesting examples of clinical healthcare where you can't really experiment on patients. You know, it's for a lot of reasons. It's either unwise or unethical or just impractical. Um, but you might want to ask some questions about patient flow. How would it work if, if we did this or if we did that? And so by building a model, you can even run a design experiment on the model that you couldn't effectively run on real people. So um, there are all kinds of applications for, uh, for process modeling. Now, just a cautionary note. Um, okay, this is a uh, Defense Department acquisition I don't know if there's anybody on the call. I'd like to be able to ask if there's anybody that's ever touched this this monster. I found this on the internet. This was just a you know a Defense Department acquisition process map. And the point I want to make about process modeling is that um, use it to solve the problem at hand. Don't use it to try to model the universe. So this. Um, this map would be, I mean, you, you, it would take forever to try to build a model that accurately represented what actually happens here. Uh, when in, in, in all reality, you're probably not, uh, other than the overall crushing complexity of the thing, uh, there's probably a certain part of the process that's really troublesome. So the key to any successful modeling is to constrain your scope to the part of the process that's really a problem and try to model that problem area and, and solve that problem, not just create a model of uh, all reality. Because simplicity is the key to excellence. It makes everything a lot easier. You know, and in the absence of that, you end up with, uh, you end up with something that's pretty, but so complicated you can't get through it. Um, and I have seen, I saw, I saw a recent example of this where, uh, a plant manager uh, was quite kind of taken with this process modeling and hired, um, hired an outside company to come in and bought some software and sent people off to training. And his one of his uh, his industrial engineering crew wanted he wanted to build a well 
backing up. The problem he was trying to solve was there was a, it's a forging operation that was always waiting on forklifts. And so they had a bottleneck. There was never trans, they couldn't move materials, always waiting on forklifts. So they built a process model of the entire plant. All right. And it took forever. It took weeks and weeks. And guess what? During that time period, the forging operation was still waiting on forklifts. And I, I mean, I would hazard a guess that building the process model didn't probably wasn't necessary in this case to solve the problem at hand, or it could have been a very simple process model just of the affected operations and it would have got, gotten done a lot faster. So just a couple of things for you to think about. All right, so to summarize, um, why do process modeling? Well, to think, building to think, using prototyping to spark creativity, to get people to think about possibilities that they wouldn't have otherwise considered. To test, to do so safely and quickly and well in advance of, um, of, of the, and we like to say test before you invest. So in advance of spending money. Um, no established operating parameters so that you know how to manage the process. So you know what's really gonna be important for us to monitor and control. And then to, to have a really, uh, a much more quantified uh, and scientific evaluation of the potential risk. And then, you know, by doing all those things, then be able to make your case and get the investment that you need uh, in order to implement the lean improvements that you, that you wanna try to implement. So I always like to close with a quote from, from Deming. And this is a great one. You know, you're getting what you get what you deserve. Right? Your system was designed to do what it's what it does. So the only way to improve what it does is to is to improve the design. If any of you want to try out process modeling, you can do it for free. You can go to it's part of the engine room application. Uh, from from more steam, you can uh, get a, a 30 day free free trial and the online tutorials are great. Um, so they'll walk you through uh, how to uh, create a process model. We'll be happy to help you if you have an interest. I'm going to put up my um, there's my uh, email. If you have questions, if you want to talk about process modeling, if you have something to contribute or uh, uh, I'd love to hear your experiences. If you've used this successfully um, or with, have had some problems or there's certain things that, that, that uh, you're working on, you just want to talk about it, then you know, this is what we do. We're pretty geeky. We like this, really like this stuff. So if you feel free to drop me a line and uh, I'd like to hear from you. And, and uh, certainly um, if you uh, care to check out uh, Process Playground, uh, in engine room we we would welcome you uh taking a look you can do that for free so with that manny i'll um close and uh we'll, 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 would be happy to entertain any uh comments or questions Manny, yeah, we're not hearing you. Manny, we're not hearing you. Gotcha. Thank you. I'm sorry. You know what? I, uh, yeah, got it. Okay. Sorry. Anyway, folks, my name is Manny. I am one of the organizers of the webinar along with Ellen Hermer. And um, I have to tell you, honestly, bouncing between these different platforms, between Zoom and BlueJeans and GoToWebinar, it, it just throws me off. So I apologize for any technical difficulties. Um, feel free to chat your or post your questions. Uh, the first one we got sort of early on, it said, Bill, I appreciate the concept of designing processes to avoid problems. The deck seems stacked against spending money and resources towards preventing problems you don't know exist or the impact of them. Systems often reward fixing problems. Mm -hmm. What strategies or tactics do you use to move these traditional barriers? Well, I, I, I'm going to guess, Manny, that question came in pretty early before I gave the, I mean, did it? Because I think the answer is building a model, right? And by building a model, you can show the cost of, uh, you can show both, you can quantify what the predicted failure 
and failure modes might be. And you can attach a cost. You know, so, so essentially you're putting dollars to your, you know, to your FMEA. And in so doing, I think you can make be much better, make a mu much, much better case for making the investment upfront to avoid fixing uh, not just a, uh, a possible problem later, but um, maybe uh, a much more specifically quantified or more specifically likely uh, problem later. Okay. Um, another question is, I guess um, the discrete process simulation, can this also be done using Monte Carlo simulation software? Okay, so the different, here's the difference. So th there, there's, a, there's a lot of similarities. The problem, okay, so, and Monte Carlo is great if you know the trans, transfer function. So with Monte Carlo, you have to be able to essentially mathematically express your, um, your transfer function or your process, your, your, uh, process flow. So if you had, uh, let's say, three, um, three processes in, and they were serial so that it was just, so maybe you're, you're modeling cycle time. So it's like my, my, my cycle time to go to work. And I have, uh, and I can break it down into, let's just say it's two components. And one is relatively predictable and it's got a nice narrow um, distribution. And then the other leg of the journey involves perhaps a train. And so the, the, the uh, distribution of cycle time for that leg of the journey maybe is highly variable because on some day, so it's got a long, and there's a, it's got a long tail on the curve because on some days there's a train or maybe it's even bi a bimodal distribution. So in that kind of circumstance, Monte Carlo is great. It's because it's simple. You can do it. It's, it, you can do Monte Carlo in engine room uh, as well. But most of the kinds of problems that you're going to be modeling don't really meet all of the, uh, the requ prerequisite uh, assumptions of Monte Carlo, which are uh, kind of independence. So normally, um, once a, an item that's going through a process, the process steps uh, uh, impact each other. And so each process step is not, um, how, do, how, do I, how do I better say this? If, you know, once you're late, then you tend to do other, uh, it, it affects you, the, your behavior later on in the process. So um, Monte, Car Monte Carlo um, is really good for simple things. Normally, when you're doing process modeling, you don't really know what the process, you can't really math very easily mathematically describe the transfer function. It's a lot easier to just draw the process and then, um, and then make some assumptions about how things flow through it um, and then just essentially run lots of items through to see what happens. I don't know if that's a great example. If you have a follow-up question, send it to me, and we I can get you probably a more coherent answer to that. Okay. Yeah. So we've gotten quite a few questions. So uh, we'll we'll try to get to all of them. Question was: Is it compatible with mini tabbies or either as an import or export? No. That was another question. It's really fundamentally different. Um, yeah. Fundamentally, fundamentally different. I mean, our, our application, our application is web-based. Um, and really, um, so what you'd do with, it, with any of these applications, if you had, um, oh, you might have data, process data, and you might um, want to um, mo model the particular, uh, let's say, time distribution for a process step and just generate the descriptive statistics or get a, you do a histogram and, you know, get a picture of what the, the distribution looks like. Um, and then if from there, it's just a matter of you know, entering the data into the into the model. It's not really that's not really a big deal. Okay, um, I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment, but someone makes the point. My biggest failure was developing a process model without involving a team. Oh. Um, any comments on that? No, I think that's a great comment. I appreciate you sharing that. I think we've probably all been through those. Probably all been through similar experience experiences where I mean it's hard to work with a team sometimes it's it's useful but it's sometimes inefficient and so there's always a temptation to just go off and do something and I mean I've always liked teams of one 
they're, they're uniquely efficient, right? There's no communication problems in, on teams of one, uh, except with the rest of the world. So uh, I think that's a great comment to remember that uh, you've really got to get different, you know, different perspectives. And it's like, it's like anything in lean, you could, you know, go to Gemba, ask, ask questions, show respect. So um, you can't, it's not a conference room activity. So lean, lean improvement doesn't happen in a conference room, you know, away from where the work is done. Same with process modeling, even though you're using a computer. Sure. Okay. Um, let's see. So there are some questions. I mean, some of them are starting to get more specific about engine room. Um, one I'll throw out there is, is there a confidence level attribute? Sure. Sure. And, you know, you can take the data. Well, there's a lot of things you can do. You can export the data from, from I think, from, probably from all these different models and then perform statistical analysis on the outputs. Uh, and, you know, and, and essentially run experiments with the models you create. So you can uh, vary inputs and then see how the, how the, how the outputs vary. And then you, know, you can, you can get pretty, that can become pretty invo as involved as you want it to be. Any of these questions, if, if we don't get to them and if you send them to me, Manny, if I, uh, if you, if you know who submitted them, I can answer them individually or, um, We'll try to get them all answered. Sure, yeah. Um, it's probably going to be more straightforward if, if they email you directly just because. Okay. So let's uh, just say that if you don't get your question answered and you have an interest in, in continuing the discussion or asking a question, if you send it to me, I'm happy to try to get, a, get you an answer. So, so Bill, one question that, that some people did have came up a couple times is, are you going to be sharing copies of the slides? Sure. Sure. Anybody that wants a copy, uh, send, send me a, uh, just send me a request and I'll post it to you somewhere. Slides are kind of big. I will tell you that I grab, you know, this is not uh, necessarily all because it's an educational purpose. Um, fair use comes into play with regard to images from here and there. So I didn't create them all. So they're not, you know, come with that disclaimer. Well, you're not making money off of them, so um, perhaps it will not be a problem. Um, also, too, some folks asked a question about will the, the link to the webinar be shared? And the short answer is yes. Uh, our goal is to get it up before the weekend on YouTube. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of editing to do that, so it's going to take a couple of days. But, um, yes, that is certainly the, the, um, the, the intention and the plan. So... Um, other than that, I see that it's two o'clock. So, um, if there are any last-minute questions, please throw them in. Otherwise, then I'm going to say thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, uh, participants. And um, the the comments that I've gotten so far, I'll share them with you, Bill. They're they're all really quite good. It's people are saying thank you. You know, good presentation. Really, a lot of interest here, so I think that's great. Right, I appreciate everyone spending um, spending an hour on yet another video conference. So, <laughs> yeah, Football. this one's better. Get a steady diet of that. So, thanks for joining us. Definitely much better. All right, folks, um, I'm going to to cut this off. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And Bill, thank you again. Don't forget, next month it's going to be. Green Six Sigma with Ron Kelly. Should be very interesting. Have All a right. good day. Good afternoon. Thanks. Bye.